Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to the organizers for putting this wonderful symposium together. It's an honor for me to join uh, the rest of the speakers here and talk about uh, this very pressing issue. Uh, my talk today is going to be focused on three main things. I wanted to cover the economic, social, and some of the political impacts of Ebola in West Africa. I wanted to talk about the response, both the US government response to date and the international community response to date, as well as the financing that's been provided to, uh, to support the Ebola response in West Africa. And then I'd like to take a step back and look at the broader implications of this outbreak for uh, the governance of uh, responses to public health events of international concern. So I think that the cases have been mentioned already. Uh, we are up to over 4,000 deaths in West Africa from this virus across the three, uh, across the actual five countries that have had cases, but the three most affected countries. And uh, what I wanted to focus on first was uh, the, the, the sort of broader economic and social impacts. So the World Bank uh, put out a study initially in September, and they updated it last week, uh, discussing uh, what they saw as the economic impacts of the Ebola epidemic in the three most affected West African countries. Uh, and this is just one of the charts from it. There are many different uh, ways that they've sliced and diced this data, but they looked at several scenarios going forward. One where Ebola is fairly well controlled, which they call low Ebola, and one uh, where the epidemic is not controlled and by the end of 2015, you have on the order of 200,000 cases, which is a very high estimate, of course. Uh, but should that occur, the economic uh, implications are very dire. Uh, in 2013, both Sierra Leone and Liberia were among the countries that experienced the highest rates of growth in the world. Sierra Leone was second, uh, and Liberia was sixth, actually. Uh, but the Ebola outbreak has already caused the economies in these countries to shrink, uh, and that trend will only continue. And wrapped up in this uh, economic data uh, is what's going on is the major sectors that are drivers of the economy in these countries, uh, the agriculture sector, which makes up 50% of the uh, economy in Liberia, the mining sector, which makes up a great portion of the uh, economies in, in, in the countries, uh, are severely impacted by the controls on movement and uh, the decisions made by individuals and firms uh, and uh, businesses to, to not engage in productive economic behavior. The fiscal implications, meaning the tax revenues for these governments just at the time when they need to be spending more on uh, responding to the epidemic have been shrinking. Uh, tax and tariff revenues are down and will continue to do so. But most of the cost from the economic uh, contraction is due to this aversion behavior, what the economists are calling aversion behavior, basically the fear and the distrust that is generated uh, by the virus. And uh, while we don't have good data on the impact of that particular behavior in West Africa right now, uh, the World Bank did a study on the SARS epidemic and found that of the 30 to 50 billion dollars that were lost during that epidemic in 2002 and 2003, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the economic losses uh, could be explained by this aversion behavior, not the direct cost of patient care uh, and not the indirect cost of lost productivity. So this is a uh, obviously very important for the governments, and Liberian governments itself has said that this raises the specter of it becoming a failed state, and that's not outside observers saying that, that's the government representatives themselves. They were meant to have a national election today, but were unable to hold it. They had to actually uh, postpone it uh, due to the, to the emergency uh, from Ebola. So turning now to the U.S. government response, there are multiple U.S. government agencies that have responded to uh, the outbreak in West Africa. Uh, I won't talk about all of these. Some of these are, uh, agencies are focused on vaccine development, and uh, we have other speakers to cover that topic, but I will uh, talk about USAID, CDC, and the Department of Defense. 
So USAID is the lead government agency that's in charge of coordinating all the different US government agencies that are involved in the response in West Africa. They have a disaster assistance response team which has been uh, on the ground since early August, uh, about 20 to 30 people, uh, and they coordinate all of the resources provided by the others. That includes the CDC, which has uh, on the order of 120, 130 people stationed across West Africa right now, the largest deployment of their staff uh, for any international health response. It's the first time that the U.S. government, through the DART process, the, U the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, has declared a disaster that is a public health disaster. So there are a lot of firsts uh, involved in the response to this. Um, as you likely have heard, the military uh, is becoming involved in the Ebola response. Uh, President Obama made a, a statement uh, about a month ago now uh, saying that the uh, Department of Defense would become increasingly involved. At the time, he stated that that would mean 3,000 troops would be sent over to assist in the response. That's now been bumped up to 4,000 troops. Not all of those are, troops are there. Uh, they're in the process of scaling that up. Somewhere on the order of 200 to 300 troops are there right now. Uh, but their responsibilities are to help build Ebola treatment units in Liberia. 17 100 bed units is the goal. And to set up a training program for up to 500 healthcare workers a week to help staff those Ebola treatment units. They also support uh, logistics and transportation by creating an air bridge and moving personnel and uh, equipment, and uh, also are involved in laboratory testing. Uh, but there's been a bright line that has been drawn by the leaders in the Department of Defense in that uh, no military medical personnel will be involved in direct patient care. At least that's uh, the thinking right now. So uh, the funding piece of this uh, this chart just shows you on the line, the, as the cases have increased over time, the commitments by the U.S. government have also increased. There was an early response uh, back when the first cases, the cluster of cases were reported out of Guinea. Uh, CDC uh, was involved in an early response, but that scaled up a little bit in August as uh, the first DART team members were sent out. And then, of course, last month were dramatically scaled up. The pledge for the U.S. government for September was that $750 million would be provided to support uh, the Ebola response. Uh, this has now actually increased in October uh, to $1.25 billion, $1 billion of which is uh, made up of uh, the Department of Defense's budget, which has been freed up uh, to be re reprogrammed from war funds, uh, the uh, Funds meant for supplemental funding for the uh, war effort in Iraq and Afghanistan is now provided for this humanitarian effort. And clearly the largest expenditure on humanitarian effort in the, in the DOD's history. Uh, but uh, that money is not free and clear. It's not ready to go. The, the, the Congress has asked the administration and the leaders of the Department of Defense to provide a more detailed plan about how that money will be spent uh, and exactly uh, in, in, uh, in which ways uh, they, they plan on doing that uh, by the end of this week, as a matter of fact. So turning to the international response, what has been the, uh, the international donors' uh, support for the Ebola response? And this data comes from the UN, the Office of the Coordinator for Humanitarian Affairs, the UN OCHA, uh, and they have a financial tracking service which uh, tries to keep tabs on all of the money being provided by all of the different players, not just donor governments, but, but, but private actors as well, uh, that are being uh, funneled towards the support for the West Africa response. I just pulled out some of this information. You can see at the, at the top there are uh, two categories of financing. There are contributions and commitments, which UN OCHA considers to be firm, either money in the bank or uh, commitments made uh, on a legal basis. There's a contract signed, so that's fairly solid commitments of financing. There are additional pledges of support, so it's important to keep in mind what's a commitment and what's a pledge. Uh, and you can see there, together they total uh, $818 million. And I pulled out uh, from that data the commitments in this bar chart uh, by various donors and actors. Uh, and you see the United States, 
uh, has provided the most uh, in terms of financing to date. Uh, but there are other very important uh, supporters, such as the World Bank, uh, African Development Bank. Um, and even uh, the Gates Foundation is on there. They've pledged $50 million uh, and have uh, provided 14 of that uh, as far as the data showed yesterday. Um, and other governments have provided uh, much less, of course, and there's been some pressure on other uh, wealthy countries to, to provide more in support. So this is what's been provided. What, has, uh, what is the estimate for what's needed? Uh, UN also has done an estimate of that and, and, and released a report in the middle of September, uh, basically outlining what they see as all of the financing needs that would be uh, required to mount a full and complete response to Ebola in West Africa. And I won't go through all of these categories here, but you can see they're, they're fairly comprehensive in that they not only consider the costs for treatments of uh, individuals in the Ebola treatment units and the contact tracing from the public health standpoint, but also uh, food security, uh, providing nutrition, making sure that uh, there are uh, transport and fuel uh, for, for, for cars and vehicles, and also community engagement. So if you add up their assessment of all of the things that were needed, uh, we get to basically a billion dollars in need for the next six months for the Ebola response. So we think back to the previous slide, in terms of firm commitments, we have about half a billion dollars, or about 50% of this need that's estimated by the UN. If you add in the pledged amounts, uh, we're about 83% of this total. So that's the financing piece, but of course, if you're gonna build 17 Ebola treatment units and, and in just Liberia, uh, you're gonna to need to staff those. And uh, one of the most striking figures, at least to me, from a recent World Health Organization situation report from last week uh, was this chart showing the uh, bed capacity and requirements for patients for Ebola in the three countries most affected. You can see here in the case of Liberia and Sierra Leone uh, that only 20 to 26% percent, uh, of the cases that need to be isolated in, in beds uh, are currently in those beds, so the demand is much higher than the current capacity uh, as far as estimated by the WHO. These data come from the ministries of health of the relevant countries. So another bottleneck here is not just the financing, of course, but where will all of the healthcare workers to staff all of these beds and these clinics come from? Uh, and there's work being done to train those healthcare workers, uh, but that there remains a lot more to be done. Uh, the, President of Sierra Leone has said he believes up to 3,000 people are going to be required in his country alone. So just to close, I'd like to step back a bit and talk about uh, the governance and the financing of response to emerging infectious diseases in general. The theme that has been emerging over uh, the past several months in relation to Ebola has been that the international community has done too little too late, and it's been poorly coordinated as it's approached this. Uh, and it might seem ironic that it's just less than 10 years ago that the international community came together to, to basically uh, reinvent the framework by which they come together and mobilize against uh, emerging infectious diseases. And that framework is the international health regulations, which were revised in 2005 and came into effect in 2007. Now that uh, framework, when it was revised, expanded WHO's mandate in the context of these public health events of international concern, and it set minimum requirements for countries to build the capacities to prepare for, to detect, and respond to emerging events of international concern within their borders. Um, and so in theory, the framework was there, but clearly, uh, in reality, uh, the investments have not been made over the seven or eight years since that uh, document was signed. And the weakness has been all along that these countries that are very poor are unable to invest in their core capacities, of course. And there is no mechanism or no requirement for 
international assistance to help in this regard to build up the basic public health capacities. Uh, everyone was on their own. Uh, even though it was in the best interest of all to make sure that those capacities did exist. Uh, so right now, uh, even earlier this year, there have been efforts to try and bolster that effort. Uh, the US-led effort to, to make the international health regulations vision a reality is called the Global Health Security Agenda, and this was launched in February. You may not have heard about it then, but you might have heard about it now. Uh, because at the time, uh, it was announced on a day when the US government was actually closed uh, due to a snowstorm. Uh, it didn't gather the kind of attention uh, that uh, it is now, because the Ebola crisis represents the exact thing that uh, this agenda is trying to address. So they recently, just a few weeks ago, had a meeting in D.C. bringing together leaders uh, of the U.S. government, uh, and we, there was very high-level representation, um, including President Obama, uh, as well as the organizations and 30 other partner countries which made pledges towards building the capacity in their own countries with assistance from the United States. As of now, there's no additional money associated with this agenda. It's really meant to be a mobilizing uh, force to get uh, the different actors to, to work towards a common goal of building public health capacity. Uh, another idea has been floated just last week by the president of the World Bank, uh, Jim Kim, saying that he thinks that there needs to be a global pandemic emergency facility. Uh, basically pre-positioned money and assets, including personnel who are experts uh, in responding to em emerging diseases, uh, that can be m rapidly mobilized in the case of, a, of an epidemic. This is just an idea at this point. It's unclear how it would work out. But it's clear from, from these efforts that the framework encapsulated by the international health regulations hasn't done the job it was intended to. Uh, and so either by working on bolstering those things through the global health security agenda or actually kind of going around the World Health Organization and the international health regulations in another sense through this global pandemic emergency facility, uh, there are attempts to try and, and tweak the system and uh, make it work better for the next time. So in closing, I just say that the lessons that I can see from this epidemic so far for the broader landscape of governance uh, in the face of public health emergencies are, are that there are, is no substitute for making sure that every country has, be, has the basic capacity to detect and respond to emerging infectious diseases uh, because they can and do arri arrive and spread without warning. Uh, therefore, any country without that capacity becomes a weak link uh, for its neighbors and perhaps even for the entire globe. And finally, underfunding global institutions leads to underwhelming results in a time of need. Thank you.